Hey, everybody in Ukraine. Uh, it's great to be here. I'm really excited to be able to give this talk. I want to thank the organizers of FW Days for inviting me. And uh, while I can't be with you, I can be with you in spirit and uh, really excited we can talk about Python for a little bit. I thought I'd talk today about Python for speed, scale, and science. And it's kind of all the things I've been using Python for over the past 20 years. And hopefully I can uh, show you a little bit of what I've learned and what I've uh, understood and a few of the things I've been involved with. I've been playing with Python for a long time. And over that time, I've learned quite a few things uh, and had a wonderful chance to be part of a number of great communities. Uh, I'm really excited that the FW Days put on this conference virtually, even though we can't be together in person. So a uh, little bit about me. I've been doing a lot of things for a long time. NumPy, SciPy is what most people know me for, or Anaconda. Uh, now I keep working on uh, science and how to make Python even better. I got my start in computational science. That's my background. I really thought I'd be a scientist and only focus on computers for science. I didn't take computer science courses in college, though I did in high school. Uh, but I really cared about using computers to do interesting things like find wind speeds over the ocean from satellite data. Or when I went and got my PhD, I was really excited about medical imaging and did projects with MRI and ultrasound, trying to find how stiff uh, matter was when it, uh, when you, what propagated waves, I'm trying to invert that. And that got me excited about computation, and that's really how I found Python. I found Python and just found it so expressive. And after a year, year and a half of using it, I just ended up spending a lot more time writing Python code and writing extensions to Python than doing science. Uh, so even as I became a professor after graduate school and continued to do science, so scanning and feeding imaging and applied mathematics, inverse problems, I kept coming back to writing Python code and trying to make the Python ecosystem better uh, because I'd fallen in love with the people in the Python community. And I really wanted to work with them to make uh, science better in Python. So my little side projects, that's my story, basically. My little side projects, I started as a scientist, ended up more of as a developer because those little side projects I was working on became my life. And then because I have a family and I really care about my family and I had to feed them and they required a lot, I have a lot of kids. Uh, but I love them all, and I was excited to help them get shoes on their feet. I ended up having to do business. And so kind of converted from a scientist to possibly a pointy-haired boss at this point. I find myself doing a lot to try to help figure out how to help open source be sustainable, and Python for science in particular. So my timeline has been, I've been involved with Python for a long time, about 20 years, 21 years. Over that time, I've had the great pleasure of being involved in, with thousands of people. And it's, it's amazing, the Python community worldwide. An exciting, you're there in, in Ukraine, I, even though I'm not there with you. Uh, people are probably seeing this all over the all over the globe, not just in Ukraine. But I know this is was intended for, for folks there in, uh, in the time zone of Eastern Europe. And I've seen it all over the world. There's wonderful people, and all of them are growing, and the community is growing. Uh, I've really been excited to try to make Python for Science popular. Uh, I ended up spending a bunch of time with a company called Anaconda. Uh, it was a... It was a, a founding with me and Peter Wang, and then Matt Harward was a friend of ours as well that helped us get Anaconda off the ground. It was called Continuum Analytics back then, and effectively as it became Anaconda, uh, Matt and I spun off a follow-on to Continuum Analytics called Quonsight, and now Open Teams. But what's exciting is realizing that as Anaconda helped people install Python better, and particularly Python for Science, this is back in the day before Python packaging has gotten better, uh, we helped a lot of scientists install a lot of Python, and that helped us grow a community of users, about 20 million users. That's just Anaconda users. So we know the Python community is even bigger than that. Uh, but that's exciting to understand just how big of an impact we're having with Python in the scientific world and the rest of the world as well. So one of the questions that I constantly get from folks, and a lot of computer scientists look at Python and go, oh, why are you using Python? It's so slow. Uh, C++, C, Java, these are the languages of speed. So what are you doing? Or, of course, there's the infamous global interpreter lock. You cannot run multiple threads in a single interpreter. So you can't scale Python possibly, can you? That's the common wisdom. And a lot of uh, particularly people new and kind of see Python at first glance, they may think, ah, i got to use Java because that has threads and co-routine, co-computation, co-routines. Uh, Surely I can't use Python. But then you look at the Google search trends and you see that, huh, Python is growing in popularity and has been really since 2015. 
and continues to grow and has really overtaken some of the more popular languages and is one of the popular languages of the world right now. It's used by some of the brightest minds and uh, the science in the Python for Speed scale and science has really been phenomenal. There's been people, um, it's been amazing to meet people. This is one of the most humbling aspects of being able to be involved in writing libraries that are used by scientists is meeting people all over the world that have done amazing things like uh, find gravitational waves. And you realize, wait, they were using libraries that I helped write. And that's really exciting. That's a great feeling. Or uh, the Higgs boson discovery, or recently the black hole imaging, where we use the entire planet as a telescope with enormous amounts of data and simulation in order to tease out from those signals of radio telescopes all around the world enough of a signal to reconstruct an image or, a, or a, uh, an image of a black hole deep in the center of a galaxy. Pretty fascinating, actually. Scientists have big data and big compute needs. Uh, here's an example from the Large Spatial, the Large Space Science Telescope. It's not operational yet, but it's going to be. We've been working, uh, had the chance to work with some of them in building an application to interact with the data sets they're dealing with. Uh, just to take a small corner of that, you probably can't read that whole slide, but it's, it's basically a massive connection of sites and data flows to process an entire image of the sky uh, real time, looking for a lot, as real time as you can get anyway, looking for anomalies, looking and really charting the sky. The data size is 60 million gigabytes, 60 petabytes, 60 million gigabytes is the kind of data they're collecting, the raw image data. Of course, they'll process it and get even more data from there. The compute power in all of the uh, data centers is 2,000 teraflops, two petaflops. Uh, that's about 30,000 of the laptops I'm using right now to talk to you. Uh, that's a lot of compute power, and that has to be orchestrated somehow. Somebody has to compute all of that. Python's involved. How does Python scale to that when it's got all of these supposed limitations? Um, and then it was amazing. Just the last year, year and a half ago, I was in Europe, and I was able to witness... Uh, the CEO of NVIDIA, uh, GPUs being the most threaded uh, hard piece of hardware, uh, and they keep getting bigger and bigger all the time. In fact, in the recent keynote, uh, Jensen described uh, cores of 8,000 or 16,000 pieces of uh, independent threads running, independent cores basically baked into a single GPU piece of hardware. How do you get Python to run all of all of that and to scale to all of that? But GPUs are being supported. It's the next. It's the de facto data science platform is Python, as uh, Jensen pointed out on the stage of GTC. How has this happened? How has Python become the most uh, dominant language in science over the past twenty years? I boil it down to three reasons. There's a lot of sub reasons, but three main reasons I think. One is the expressivity. It's expressive and easy to read. People that don't program all the time, but do need to program for their job, they're domain experts, occasional programmers, they don't want to learn a difficult language with lots of syntax that's sort of hard to follow. They want to have a language that matches their ways of thinking mathematically or their ways of thinking in other ways. So the fact that Python's a teaching language, is expressive, has helped it grow. In my case, for example, Pythonic code helps me think better. It gets out of my way. It lets me just think about what I'm writing uh, write what I'm trying to do instead of what syntax do I use? And I found that to be truer and truer. And, and li some libraries do that better than others, but um, it's amazing when it all comes together and you can really scale your thinking quickly. And then in particular, CPython, the CPython runtime, is straightforward to extend. It's been easy. You can just see enormous numbers of extension modules. And these are the extensions to Python like NumPy, uh, and then Pandas has more, and Scikit-Learn has more, and uh, SciPy has more. Uh, in fact, SciPy extends Python with Fortran code, effectively you know, bringing that language to the modern world in spades and droves. And because it's straightforward to extend and fairly uh, often d d well documented, and now with the existence of something like called Cython, which makes it even easier, Python has become a glue. It's a glue language for other runtimes. So in fact, when you're using Python for speed, scale, and science, you're almost always actually running machine instructions compiled from another language, glued together with the high-level and expressive Python. So it's a little bit of a, perhaps, uh, we're not running the Python interpreter to get speed and scale, but we're using the Python syntax and the Python runtime to pull together everything together, and it's still Python. And for the front-end user, it feels like Python. And the last reason for Python success 
is a wonderfully engaging open source community. It's been really amazing to watch that community grow. Uh, one of the things I've started to learn and understand about open source is that not all open source is the same. And Python, for example, is a wonderful example of a community-driven open source software ecosystem. Call that CDOS. Uh, and you compare that to some wonderful other packages that are company-backed open source software. Things like Swift and uh, PyTorch, and TensorFlow. Um, wonderful projects, but ultimately to be, uh, you have to work at a company to be the leader. Python is different like NumPy and SciPy and Jupyter and other projects where the community is the project and anybody who participates and jumps in and spends enough time contributing, uh, Python even took patches from me uh, back in the day when I was really contributing a lot of code. And uh, so if that doesn't prove you can, uh, anybody can contribute to Python, I don't know what does, but I was, I, I just love the way that the Python community was welcoming and it wasn't necessarily, they wouldn't take um, code that wasn't great, uh, but they would help and they would help you make your code better. And it was really, really wonderful to work with the community. And I think that's one of the reasons Python has become so popular. So of course, if you're gonna use Python for speed and scale, you have to use the libraries that enable it to be used for speed and scale. Uh, libraries like NumPy, TensorFlow, Pandas. Uh, this is a Google search trends that shows basically how those libraries have compared with, the, with machine learning and have grown with the growth of machine learning. In 2015, roughly TensorFlow burst into the scene. Everybody got excited about deep learning. And that kind of brought a lot of people to thinking about array computing, what I call array computing, or computing with large amounts of data. And in, that really accelerated interest in Python. Like I really attribute a lot of the growth of Python most recently in the past two or th five years to the growth of deep learning, machine learning, where Python has had 15 years prior to that to percolate and create a fabulous solution. Uh, but NumPy is still you know, quite popular and growing in, uh, in, in Google searches. So we'll go on now to talk about the projects that really help Python be, be useful for speed and scale. My first big project was SciPy. It started as multi-pack in 1998 and it evolved and has a long history. Uh, until 2001, it became SciPy with the help of colleagues and it's now massive community of users and releases. Uh, SciPy itself is really a distribution of a lot of numerical tools kind of masquerading as one library. It really is why a scientist like me who started writing libraries for Python ended up creating a distribution for Python called Anaconda because that's what SciPy ultimately was to start with. And really the packaging problem was front and center for me for 15 years until we finally solved one which solved it with Conda. Uh, cluster, FFT pack, there's a lot of great tools inside of SciPy and you take a long time to learn it. I was really excited this year to uh, see this notice where Polly and Rolf and uh, some other great contributors wrote, put a lot of work into writing a nature methods paper. So though I've left academia, uh, I was really thrilled to be included in this list of authors and SciPy 1.0 finally had a paper. Uh, project started in 1998 and this paper was published in 2020. Uh, patience, persistence, grit, uh, that's the a lot of times things take a while to percolate and bake, but it gives them a robustness and a power and a, and a link and a continuation. So be patient if your project hasn't quite taken off yet. Um, if it's good, keep learning, keep improving. If it's good, it'll, it'll be used and uh, you'll get a community around it. For me, NumPy came because I wanted to make SciPy useful. Uh, the community was splitting, was changing. There were several array libraries and people were building versions of SciPy on different libraries. That was uncomfortable and I wanted to help bring the community back together. So I spent a bunch of time uh, writing something that became called Num that was called NumPy. I built on the shoulders of giants, built on numeric, built on numeray, built on the contributions of so many people. And really NumPy has become successful because of the contributions of so many people as well. Almost a thousand contributors have participated over the past 12, uh, 13, 14 years to make NumPy what it is today really my open source addiction. So NumPy is essential if you wanna do fast code. And the reason is because it takes code like this where you're iterating over a list. And if you're executing this in the Python runtime at every instruction, it's gonna be fairly slow. It turns this kind of code uh, into functions that work across a whole array of code. So it takes um, elements, a list of Python objects, converts that to a single Python object pointing to a byte a blob, a blob of bytes to talk to data. And then on top of that, offers n-dimensional arrays or functions that let you do fast math, Fourier transforms, then your algebra, basic random numbers. 
gives you a basic set of, of tools to do science with uh, right out of the box, right out of the gate. So it's an array extension of Python. Um, very heavily makes use of the C Python API, which is one of the reasons it's hard to port to other runtimes like PyPy, like Jython prior, like Iron Python, uh, Rust Python's emerging. There's a bunch of other wonderful emerging runtimes of Python, but NumPy, the way it is currently, relies heavily on the C Python API extension. So that has to something has to be done there. Those something like that has to be ported to those other runtimes. Turns out to be a major imp impediment because of the reliance on that C Python API. That's why C Python is the common runtime for Python for Science. And to get speed and scale, you really do need to use C Python. So uh, again, the NumPy array gives you this. Uh, basic data structure that points to a blob of data and it uh, helps you under interpret those data as an array. Uh, examples of NumPy, uh, you can have a two-dimensional array, a three-dimensional array. It really helps you start thinking about your data and it's one of the most important ways to get speed and scale from Python is to think of your data in blobs, in blocks. Rather than thinking of it as single lists of integers, single lists of floats, you think of it as an entire array of numbers that you're going to do fast operations on. And now more and more, do it in chunks, do it in columns, do it in, in uh, uh, segments that can be scaled to GPUs and beyond. Uh, NumPy has uh, slicing. It builds on Python's tremendous slicing syntax for lists and one-dimensional uh, arrays and extends that to two dimensions. lets you just extract uh, very sometimes complicated expressions right out of the array and then do something with those expressions. Bit of a query syntax, essentially. And then NumPy added some really high uh, advanced indexing uh, to do even more uh, expressive syntax when it became popular. So for summary, the first element for speed in Python is NumPy. And you've got to use NumPy and get to know it. Um, now, the array object in NumPy, there's many other versions. There's a CuPy that lets you do it on GPUs. There's uh, uh, there's PyTorch and TensorFlow that mimic the NumPy API and kind of have a different runtime. The array concepts in NumPy are growing and growing, and, and they're sort of going beyond the runtime of, Pyth of NumPy. But it's still a foundational set of uh, tools and set of understandings to get in order to really take advantage of Python for speed and scale. Now, with NumPy at a, at a core, really the goal of NumPy was succeeded, which was to create an ecosystem around this array that will allow lots of people to build libraries on top. And it's really surpassed my wildest expectations what's happened. There's just massive numbers of libraries that are out there uh, from a, the, a, in layers, basically. You've got the kind of SciPy layer. You've got a, low, a, a Matplotlib and Pandas layer. You've got NetworkX and domain-specific layers. Then you've got even higher level machine learning layers and beyond, domain specific layers and beyond. It's really quite amazing what's happened in the community in order to uh, create these tools. So that's the basics of getting speed and scale out of Python is use NumPy, use SciPy, use the ecosystem around it. And that ecosystem is full of hundreds of tools now, actually. So if you want to do some kind of uh, high level operation, find the tool that does it. And most likely it'll help you get the speed and scale you're looking for. Now, if you want to get dig, dig deeper and actually build some tools that have speed and scale, there's some amazing libraries out there that let you do that now. I'm going to talk about two of them, uh, Numba and Dask, two that I've had a, a more intimate involvement with over the past uh, five, six, seven years. Um, there are many, many others that are emerging, things like Vix and Modin and Pythran and Jax. Uh, it's actually uh, amazing, the tools that are out there and emerging. Um, it's uh, for someone like me who's been around Python for so many years, it really floors me to see how much is out there. And it's such a wonderful time to be a Python developer. There's so many projects to get involved with, so many uh, tools to get to know and to learn and to tinker with and dig in deeper with. And I encourage you, let your curiosity carry you. Let your curiosity just get you to dive in and learn something from these tools that are there. It's, a, it's an amazing time for the open source community. It's an amazing time where you're at, where you are. Everyone here who's listening has something you can bring. You just have to pull out your curiosity and your best interest. And then try to find those opportunities where they are. Um, and uh, look for companies that are willing to let you explore your curiosity as well. Uh, so speed and scale. Speed, scale up is really speed. And that's using bigger and bigger machines and more and more threads. And then scale out is more, more and more nodes. I'm going to use a different machine. 
So like I said about the LSST project, you might have 30,000 machines. Maybe it's only 100 machines, but each one has uh, 30, 30 nodes or 3,000 cores if it's got GPU capability as well. So there's different ways and configurations that machines come today. And managing all that can be quite complex. And libraries out there can help you. Uh, so let's talk about just a single machine or a, a parallel machine, a multi-core machine. How am I going to actually write code that makes that runs very quickly on that? Maybe even using many, many threads. Well, we really need a compiler. We need to take the Python code that's normally interpreted and then actually use maybe the same syntax for Python, but take that syntax and a subset of that of the Python language and compile it. That's the idea of Numba, is basically make a compiler that compiles a subset of the language specifically tailored towards array computing. And that's the reason it works and, and, and is for that use case and that um, subset of interactive coding. Uh, compilers can be hard. Compilers take a long time. Uh, but I've been really pleased with the progress of Numba and it's used quite heavily by a lot of people today. So um, how does it work? Uh, this open source JIT compiler, it's a function at a time compiler. You actually explicitly tell it which functions to compile. And you basically can get different targets. So you tell the tell the compiler to compile for a, a single CPU. That's the default. Or you can make it multi-threaded. You can have a target that's a GPU or an HSA. And there's the there's a compile uh, decorator. And then there's um, make me a function. There make me a, a special uh, NumPy ufunc or universal function decorator. We'll explain both of them. You can get speed ups. And sometimes you may not get any speed up. If you actually you can't just JIT compile all Python and get speed up. If your Python is doing a lot of list lookups and a lot of dictionary and a lot of sort of wandering through memory, you're probably not going to not going to get much speed up with the JIT compiler because it'll just return Python interpreter loops. But if you're speeding up code that's that's basically um, iterating through an array of data and you're you're at a for loop, um, a double for loop, a nested for loop, you can really get 200x speed ups and beyond if you take advantage of GPUs as well. So it really helps you. Use Python syntax to write fast code. You don't have to reach for C. You don't have to reach for Fortran. You don't have to reach for C++ to get fast code that you prototype or explore with Python. So it's 100% open source. Uh, there's a lot of things that it does that are really nice. Ultimately, this is a diagram I like to use because it explains that a compiler really is taking, you know, uh, if you think about how Mimble works, it's really similar to uh, the Clang compiler which takes C++ syntax and converts it to LLVM. This compiler takes Python syntax, uses the uh, a translator to translate it to uh, LLVM, the level virtual machine uh, code, which is the same backend in a, in a claim compiler. And it creates that same intermediate representation and then uses LLVM to generate the code. So Numba actually doesn't do any parsing and doesn't do any code generation. Two of the hardest problems in a compiler. Uh, but it's still it's still some challenging to write a compiler, but it's basically a mapping from Python bytecode to LLVM intermediate representation. There's some things it has to do. Uh, like one of the challenges is Python code doesn't have any type information. And so you basically, it's a template. You have, you know, here's some variables and they come into a function and then there's some Python code. What types are it? In order to generate compiled code, I got to know what type it is. Is it an int? Is it a float? Is it a string? What is it? Well, the first time you call a function with JIT and you don't, it doesn't know the types, it basically just waits. It creates a, a temporary uh, function that returns. And then the next time you call it, it says, okay, now I'm calling it with real arguments with an X and a Y that are integers. Now I know what those types are. Python is dynamically typed. It is typed. It's just dynamically typed. Every variable has a type. Once you call the function, now the code knows what types it's getting and it can actually do type inference for all the other variables and then rewrite the intermediate representation, lower it down to LVMIR and generate bytecode, generate compiled code. Really kind of fun, really kind of amazing actually, um, magical at first. And then you, when you start to realize how it works, you go, this is really cool. Uh, and I remember when the, I, I've wanted a compiler for Python for so long when I, when, we, when I finally had it, it was like, oh, I've been waiting for this for a long time. Very exciting uh, uh, project to be a part of. And it's been amazing to watch it grow. And then to see other projects like it, Jax, Python, many other projects like it. So it's not alone in the ecosystem now. 
Um, it supports many, many uh, open source uh, op operating systems and hardware platforms and software platforms. Basic example, you have a function, you want to, you have a JIT decorator. You don't, um, no Python equals true is a, it's, it's also comes in an NJIT flavor. And what it means is raise an error if you actually can't lower everything to get rid of Python objects. Um, you want to get rid of the Python objects to, so you can lower the machine code. If you can't, raise an error. The default is not raise an error, but just give you back code that will run. Uh, so but you can see that you call it, it looks like NumPy code. It, it even supports a lot of the NumPy syntax. So you have the empty like, you have these NumPy functions that effectively were re-implemented in uh, the numbers uh, instruction set. And you have looping that looks very similar for element in X. Uh, you have these if statements, control flow, and you can use NumPy math functions and you can return slices of arrays. That all works. And, it, and instead of actually using the NumPy runtime, it compiles all that to machine code. And the result in this case where you're using NumPy anyway, it's only 2.7x speed up, but that's still pretty good. But if you actually have a loop in there, it can speed up to 100 or 200 times. So Numb is a great tool for building libraries that do scale, that scale uh, and that give you speed. Uh, it dispatches to multiple type specializations for the same function. So if you call it with floats and you call it with ints, you end up with different compiled functions, but that's all behind the scenes and the user doesn't really know. And it just different, it dispatches to the one that is correct for the calling convention. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty mature project. It's still as a compiler, um, you know, full compilers. I mean, I, you can't use Numba to take Python and compile all your Python code. You really have to be careful about how you use it. It doesn't, it doesn't support, for example, functions as arguments. Uh, there's, uh, there's still many, many corner cases where it's not necessarily going to do everything you might expect. Uh, so, but for use cases of writing uh, great kernels, writing kernels that um, of fast code on arrays, images, sound, uh, video, it works really, really well and means you don't have to pull out your C or your C++ for just that one little tight loop that you want to be fast. Um, you can get the uh, uh, machine code out of it and you can look at the machine code and it supports, because LLVM, the compiler infrastructure behind, can code generate for AVX instructions, it can generate uh, fast code. So sometimes you might have to tweak, tweak it in order to get the fastest code out, particularly the configuration options, but it's possible. Another exciting feature of Numba is you can actually release that global interpreter lock and you can write low level code that is threadable. Now you then have to use it with something like Concurrent Futures in order to allow those threads to run uh, when they're uh, in separate instructions essentially. But using something like NoGill with a number uh, JIT function and a Concurrent Futures model, you can get linear scaling and have, it, have your Python code Use multiple threads. Totally possible today. Um, in NumPy, there's a thing called the universal function. It's a core concept. And what it, and the universal function is simply a function that maps over all the elements of an array and gives you an output. It's a very parallel or concurrent thing to do. If I have an array of numbers and I want to uh, add two arrays of numbers, uh, I could execute that in parallel pretty easily. Um, view functions are a great model for uh, doing parallel execution. And so that's why we created something called Vectorize, which basically takes us uh, a, num a uh, Python function, compiles it to a low-level function, and then produces a universal function that can be parallelized very, very quickly. And this is a great way to write very fast functions with Python. So for example, here's taking that Vectorize function, uh, here giving the type specifically, so you can create a parallel target now what that does is it produces a universal function that actually executes on multiple threads and it will automatically use all the cores. Now if you change that target to CUDA or to HSA, now you can use all the cores on a GPU of it as well, if you have a GPU. Um, this is the easiest way to program a GPU that I still know of. Uh, it's, a, it, it's a model that works really, really well. It's sort of the UFUNC model of NumPy maps very, very well to the multi-core model and the many, many core model of GPUs. Um, now, it doesn't solve every problem, but it, it illustrates if I can actually break my problem up into chunks of data being operated on by these fast functions, I can produce some amazing code very, very quickly. Um, other number of topics we won't cover here, don't have time to get into. 
Uh, there's there's a CUDA Python. You can actually write low-level CUDA code for Python. Uh, there's streaming. There's a CUDA simulator in Python and Numba, actually, and uh, PyCulib for access to the GPU. So the other topic I wanted to talk about was Dask, because this is how you can scale Python today. And Dask is an amazing project. Started in 2014 at Anaconda, uh, part of our efforts to scale Python, to scale NumPy and Pandas, basically. We had that as a goal at Anaconda. And with Dask, thanks to the efforts of people like Matt Rocklin and Jim Christ and others, we were able to produce a, uh, an amazing tool that has continued to go on and NVIDIA's invested in it and uh, Intel's invested in it and other people have invested in this tool um, that really allows you to scale the entire Python ecosystem. Uh, people have heard of Spark. Spark is very popular. Very, uh, In fact, Spark 3.0 is just released. It's a very nice tool. Uh, Dask was created to specifically scale the Python ecosystem without having to pull Java into the equation. You still can if you want to, and it's it's great if you do, but a lot of times you don't need it, and it's a lot simpler just to use something like Dask. Uh, it scales from a single machine to thousands of clusters, but Dask really works well with many, many machines, uh, and it's resilient, responsive, and really maps to the array API of NumPy and the data frame API of Pandas. So basically, if you're a NumPy or a Pandas user, Dask becomes very natural to use. Dask also has capabilities to really scale any kind of object, which is which is pretty nice. So if you have a concept like a glob, uh, you want to scale glob across multi-cores. Dask can be used to make a scalable glob command, for example, very, very simply. What, what Dask does is it um, breaks up the problem into multiple parts and then stitches together a dependency graph so that it executes the parts that are needed. It does not all basically be for you behind the scenes. And so, but you end up with this execution graph that has to be executed. And there's a scheduler. So uh, Dask does this uh, by taking Numba, it sort of crosses the divide from Numba on a single machine or NumPy on a single machine, Pandas on a single machine, to executing like you're using a single array in a single data frame, but now it's running on many, many machines. Pretty powerful idea. It has this task graph in the middle and then it, that task graph is constructed by calls to arrays and data frames and using the delayed or bag is basically a list, uh, like a Python list, but can work on many, many machines. And then it takes that task graph and executes on a scheduler. And there's a separation of concerns in the code. So it's, it's, you can add a new scheduler. In fact, the synchronous scheduler was first to test things out, then a threaded scheduler and a multiprocessing scheduler. Now the distributed scheduler gets a lot of attention. It's probably one of the best, most robust schedulers. So most people just use the distributed scheduler all the time with Dask today. But the concept of that scheduler is there and you can write your own scheduler. If you have a particular uh, runtime you want to take advantage of, write a, a Dask scheduler for it. And you can take advantage of all the other parts of Dask. Uh, the way Dask looks is it's like Pandas. So you import Pandas as PD and read a file and look at the head and do some calculations. Um, you can do that same calculations basically, except import Dask data frame. Uh, the read CSV is there, same computation essentially. But because Dask is building a task graph, it doesn't actually eagerly evaluate every time you express something. It basically returns futures, it returns a, an object that is waiting. And you have to actually explicitly say in many cases compute. There are some cases where it will trigger a compute, uh, but most of the time you have to tell it, hey, I, I want this result now. And then it goes off and, and executes the graph of tasks that you've implicitly created by structuring your code as if it were pandas. So it takes, um, the key part is it basically takes your large array and breaks into chunks and uses pandas underneath, which makes it very, very nice for scaling. You don't have to learn a new language. You don't have to learn a new syntax. You can work on problems in the small with pandas and then scale it using Dask very straightforwardly. NumPy arrays are similar. There's a Dask array where you can, you can construct your code as if it were small, and then just with a essential import change, you can scale it with a couple, and that doesn't quite work perfectly, but you can scale it with a couple of uh, additional calls. Now that's getting better and better. And there's also a project called X-Array, for example. If you start with X-Array, X-Array will use Dask to scale. There's other projects like Modin. Modin will use Dask to scale. And so you can kind of use these high level, higher level projects that automatically 
uh, scale for you, and then it's sort of a one API. That's pretty exciting. It's getting easier and easier to use to get to the dream where, uh, and as data scientists, I just write code, and then the runtime environment determines which how to scale it for me. Uh, not quite there yet, but we're getting closer and closer, and you can certainly do a lot today at scale uh, with data. Many people have reported, uh, you know, a lot of people, and you know, no disrespect to Spark, it's a wonderful project, but a lot of people, um, especially if they're using PySpark, kind of PySpark leads them closer to wanting to write Scala code, and then they get to Scala, and then they're kind of unhappy, and they wish they were back in Python land. With Dask, you're writing Python code the whole time. And so sometimes um, people find, and, and especially if they're PySpark users, they're pretty excited when they learn Dask and they realize they can get the same performance, the same scaling properties, but using something entirely from Python. So a very Pythonic scaling story. And uh, same story exists for NumPy arrays. You break it up into chunks. Each of the chunks are run with NumPy. Uh, and then, but the scheduler takes care of running those. So that's Dask. And Dask lets you... Um, the key to Dask really is the scheduler, and scheduling arbitrary graphs is hard. Um, Matt Rockland has done a lot of work here and has really also aggregated the work from lots of people in order to, uh, there's no perfect solution for optimal graph scheduling. There's a lot of heuristics basically have to be built in, and that's the Dask scheduler has been improving ever since about 2015 when it was first constructed. A lot of monitoring. A lot of information about the sizes, a lot of information about where, where, where things are and what should happen next, how long things take to compute is stored and used to come up with uh, better approaches. So that's Dask. Dask is a tool, Pythonic, Pythonic, it's written in Python, and it allows you to scale your Python code to thousands of nodes. Uh, really, really exciting, actually. And especially if you couple Python and Numba uh, with GPU support, now you can do amazing things. You can really take advantage of the fastest machines on the planet, all with Python, and get the best performing code, all with Python. One of the really exciting things about Dask are these beautiful diagnostic dashboards. Many people find it mesmerizing, hypnotizing, to basically fire up Dask, look at these dashboards as they really start to understand what's happening as they do a huge uh, 500,000 by 500,000 array computation that really takes uh, 100 compute nodes. And you can watch that sort of execute in real time. It's pretty exciting. So that's 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 pretty fun as people learn to do that. So Python can be used for speed and scale, and it's pretty exciting. Uh, there are some reasons not to use Dask. Uh, it's not a SQL database. A lot of times you really just use using SQL uh, in order to scale your computations. Um, things like Ibis, for example, can help you translate pandas code to a SQL expression. And run that run that expression on the data in a SQL database. Uh, Dask is an MPI for those that are familiar with HPC applications. It's fast, but it does leave some performance on the table. You can do about 5,000 tasks per second. Uh, execute with Dask on a single that's the head node. Uh, and then Dask isn't a JVM technology. Uh, it's Python. So if you need integration with JVM, maybe Spark's fine for you. And you also the most important, you don't always need parallelism. Dask is not always strictly necessary, actually. So uh, important to keep that in mind as you're thinking about, do I use Dask or not? So in summary, basically, we've Python's taken over uh, because it has speed. It can, it can create fast runtimes, create fast executions, and it can scale because of tools like NumPy, SciPy, Pandas, uh, and then all of the ecosystem around it. Now, most recently, Numba, uh, Pythran, Jax and Dask and Modin and Vix. There's some amazing tools that exist today. Uh, so thanks to all of these wonderful people I've had the privilege of interacting with over the past many years. But we sort of won in the sense that, well, all these amazing community developers have created some amazing tools, but they're still not very maintained. They're not, they're not maintained. There's no big company behind them to make sure that they're maintained. Now, there's a lot of work happening and a lot of things are changing. And, you know, NumFocus was created to funnel resources into a central place where it can be distributed to uh, the projects. There's other things emerging. That's kind of what I'm working on myself over the next 10, 20 uh, years, is how do we keep growing this capability but also sustain it? That's what gets me excited. Also excited about technology. My technology directions are really all about not a, not a new array library, although one's 
could be needed. Actually, what I see as possible is to create an array interface, or array APIs uh, that libraries consume or produce. And what that would allow is for many, many uh, producers of the library to interact with many, many consumers of the library. And so you can have things like SciPy on top of an API, scikit-learn on top of an API, that instead of having to write a new scikit-learn for every TensorFlow or Torch that emerges. Uh, that's an exciting project we're working on right now and in support with some industry partners uh, at Quantsite Labs. Uh, Quantsite Labs is a nonprofit uh, part of the Quantsite effort, which is a, a open source uh, support company. Quantsite Labs is dedicated to hiring people to work in the open source PyData ecosystem. Uh, it's just, it was incubating last year and we just emerging this year as an independent entity. I uh, was very excited by Quantsite Labs, excited that we're pulling it off and making it happen. Another technology piece that gets my attention is we've got to figure out how to improve the runtime of CPython. We've got to figure out how to help people write extensions for Python that can port to other runtimes. Wouldn't it be wonderful if NumPy was easily ported to Iron Python, Jython, PyPy, Rust Python, if it didn't have to be rewritten, basically, for each of those runtimes? Could we do that? Well, the answer is yes, we could do that. We just take some effort to not use the CPython API, but instead maybe something different. And now with, with kind of Cython and its history working, things like Numba working, things like MyPy, um, and uh, optional, static, optional static typing to Python, we can do this. We can create an, a statically typed subset of Python that is used to extend Python. And we call it ePython for extending Python. So we've started this project. It's a very, very new project. Really only if you're super interested in this, come join me, uh, epython-dev on GitHub. Uh, basic architecture is laid out. We're right in the point, point of having to actually uh, take uh, Astor and create a, a, a tree, take the AST and convert it to a Cython output. Uh, we're gonna leverage Cython to get the CPython runtime. Then we're gonna leverage something else to get Py, PyPy runtime. Uh, fun times, expect to some, hear something about this perhaps in a year, uh, maybe by the end of the year. Uh, and if, if, you're, if you can fund it or you know someone can fund it, let me know. Uh, the more funding we have, the better we can do it. Uh, I was told about Quantite Labs, super exciting project. It's uh, Rolf Gomers helps me run this. We've got a board with Carol Willing and Lalitha, Krishnamurthy, who help advise us to really make, really hire people to work on the PyData ecosystem. It's basically a fulfillment of a dream I've had for a long time. Uh, and Anaconda, we started this, and Anaconda has a good open source group now. But I want Quantsite Labs to grow to 75, even 100 people uh, working on this stack. I have to do, we've got some business ideas how to grow that and how to do it, but we're working on that. And then finally, I have a project called uh, Open Teams, which is really solving the problem of how do we connect the open source support ecosystem to the companies that need the help but don't really have easy ways to get it. We'll talk more about this in the coming year, but keep your eye on Open Teams and uh, go sign up. If you want to work with me, if you're interested in getting to know kind of how you could work with me directly, go make a profile on Open Teams and let me know. Point me to it. I'd love to see you. Love to hear from you. Love to understand what you are trying to do. And if there's projects you care about or jobs you're interested in, uh, make a profile on Open Teams, show who you are, and then point me to it. And uh, Quonsite hires from Open Teams. Uh, so many of our clients of open, of open Teams also hire from the profiles uh, existing there. So that's Open Teams. It's going to be growing more and more this year. And finally, I, I do have a little project, a little bit of notion here. Expect to hear more about this later this year. But this is the idea of, I think we've figured out a way to make open source itself investable and unlock the trillions of dollars that are available currently investing in markets around the world. Let's see if we can't convert some of those dollars to actually invest more directly in open source projects that are meaningful and valuable to the companies that make up uh, the capital markets of the world. Uh, so I think we've got to figure out a way to do that. More will be coming in the, in the next little while about that. So keep keep your eye on that. Uh, so really grateful I had a chance to come here. Uh, last, I kind of want to just say, you can change the world. Uh, don't, don't underestimate the power of working with open source communities and being patient and uh, caring and going outside of yourself and kind of letting some things go and, and looking to forgive and looking to how do you just make the world better and how do you focus on getting better yourself and writing better code to make um, make the world a better place. Uh, let's do more of that. 
I think Python is a great place to explore that. And there's a lot of tentacles out there into the rest of the world to really make use Python as a foundation to make your contributions with the world. So let's do more of that. Thanks, everybody. It's been great.